Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Think Bamboo podcast. I'm your host, JJ, and um, this is the Think Bamboo podcast. We talk about bamboo and what can be done with bamboo and uh, what has been done with bamboo. And we have a great guest who have been working with bamboo for a long time and even longer time. And today we're here with Johan Gielis from Belgium. Hello, Johan. Hello, hello, JJ. <laughs> Thank you. Nice for... to meet you. We met in Germany, but uh, here we are again. So yes, virtually online. Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm I'm very glad to have you here. Um, because um, I know or I, I I learned that you have been very active or like for very long time already with bamboo also. Um, but mm -hmm. um, maybe you want to give a, a like a small introduction about what you have been doing because you have been doing a, a few interesting things, uh, so far. <laughs> yeah. So my background is actually uh, horticulture engineering. So I started working with Jan Oprins in uh, Belgium, who asked me to, to develop a micropropagation system, very fast propagation in vitro uh, for bamboo. Uh, but at that time, hundreds of labs around the world were trying to do that. So it turned out to be very, very difficult. So and and it took like us all... 20 years ago or... No, no, I'm... in the mid eighties. I started wow. in the mid eighties. Yeah, so wow. I'm an old, getting an old person. So, wow. but uh, but eventually we developed a method which could be used for temperate and tropical bamboos. Uh, so now there's an operation in Belgium doing ornamentals, trop, uh, temperate bamboos, and there's an operation in uh, Indonesia doing. Uh, yeah, tropical bamboos. So I estimate I've, over all these years, I've, I've not been involved actively in the past 10 years there, but I, I think that around 30 million bamboos have been produced via the methods that we developed here. So wow. that's not bad. So that's, I can I can still print a few pages without feeling bad. So. That's that's uh, that's really amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And along the way, uh, I did a lot of... Uh, uh, research on bamboo, on the genetics of bamboo, on the flowering of bamboo, on the physiology of bamboo. And I spoke, uh, most of it is uh, documented in the presentation that I gave in uh, Dortmund, and you can download it from my research gate page. It's there to download. Uh, but we also were involved in various uh, European projects to assess if bamboo would be a viable alternative uh, for addition to European agriculture. We were also involved in international projects uh, uh, with the uh, Philippines, Malaysia, India. I visited Indonesia. I visited Indonesia, uh, India many times, uh, Indonesia as well. Um, so, but then, uh, well, I made a discovery in bamboo in geometry and mathematics. Uh, so I had to go another way. So now I'm working uh, in an antenna company, which was developed around the work that I did in bamboo. So from bamboo to antennas, Wow. Uh, for me, it's uh, yeah, a small step. We're 35 people now. Um, so, but there's everything has a biological component in technology. Huh? So we can learn from from biology. So, so uh, that's. But um, this morning, I also gave. A, a, actually, my my talk in Dortmund was one of the first that I gave on bamboo in 10 years, and this morning I also gave a talk on carbon, and so on on uh, in the workshop in. Uh, the, the the arboretum of Jan Oprin, So any chance we can we can share That's that on the blog post? Yeah. Is it public or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. so uh, yeah, yeah, we can share information cool. afterwards. Cool, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. I shared it via LinkedIn. One picture of the participants on Monday. So I saw that. I saw that. But if you have like more more uh, information there, a presentation or something. Well, I only I only have my presentation and the, the program. So the idea was there uh, for the participants, not to talk uh, how fantastic bamboo is, but to get uh, to the real numbers. Huh? So okay. if you set up a plantation, what do you need? If you think I need to buy one million plants of bamboo, go figure because that's not impossible. Where do, where are you going to shop for them? Huh? Yeah. Uh, if you want to plant bamboo, how do you do that? If you divide bamboo, how do you set up a nursery and things like that? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and there was uh, Jean-Luc Kujumji uh, talking about uh, uses, uh, let's say, preservation of bamboo uh, uh, and about using in uh, 
uh, uses of bamboo in, uh, in various ways in materials. So. Cool. No, that's really, I mean, this helps to really understand that people get a better understanding of what's possible, how to do it, how to advance and all that, because we're still very early, kind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think what I also mentioned in Dortmund is that I'm, a, say, I'm a hardcore scientist. Uh, my my inspiration was Professor Walter Lise, dear friend, who passed away in the, uh, in the beginning of this year. Uh, and facts, not fiction. That's uh, so. Stick to the facts, and if you don't have the facts, get them right. Huh? So get them or nothing <laughs> until you get yeah. the real facts. Yeah, cool, cool. Fantastic. We see a lot of extrapolations in bamboo about over overestimating the the let's say the the biomass, overestimating carbon capture, overestimating revenues, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should not be doing that. It's a, it's a normal crop with fantastic cover opportunities um, of, um, but we need to be realistic huh? yeah like everything so if we right? sell if we sell bamboos to farmers farmers want to make an income and they need to be made sure then in five years from now uh, they still have an income to to have a living for their family uh, and if, if you're talking not about one one uh, say uh, farmer but maybe hundreds of them so, so you should be uh, yeah, realistic and uh, scientifically uh, driven to get the numbers right. Absolutely, and and I really again repeating what you said before, um, we can learn a lot about nature. Every technological yeah. probably invention or, or or service or product is is something where um, somebody has has observed nature very well and understood something. And uh, like like what you do with the antennas, uh, I don't know if it's directly linked to to the geometry of bamboo, but um, yes, it, is. it is. It is cool. So yeah. this is another topic. We really have to find some time. No, we, we could take that for another time. Yeah, so. absolutely. But just to mention Victor Schauenberger, a German um, scientist who lived uh, some time before, he also observed a lot um, in in nature. And um, it's it's I think it's a similar approach um, to really learn from nature how nature works and, and try to understand and that's permaculture too right and lots of principles like that yeah. where um, uh, this is uh, really like very valuable but not so easy because it's not like just like a book where you learn yeah. everything and and you um, have to it's like a recipe book huh? exactly so every location is different uh, exactly. exactly every farmer is different different and so on exactly so um then to our main topic let's uh dive into this so as uh, we know and everybody knows um a lot of people talk about bamboo and the uh, the fantastic limitless added value of of bamboo once you harvest the bamboo and transform it in something which has more, more value which is great yeah. very good and and everything but here comes the the very interesting thing there is another side of that coin, which are the ecosystem services of bamboo, yeah. for example. And this is something um, maybe you can you can give a like a a intro to to this topic because it's, I mean it's it's it, it has a lot of layers. Probably why it's not well understood or why people are not talking yeah. about it. Um, but let's talk ecosystem services. Yeah, Johan, please. But I, uh, yeah, well, I think so. What I would like to do first is to to make understand where bamboo comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, so bamboo is a grass. Huh? So grasslands are uh, really small plants growing uh, in open plains, uh, as opposed to forests. Now, actually, the the uh, let's say the evolution of bamboo was actually that grasses moved back into the forest and made themselves uh, let's, uh, let's say woody. Huh? Mm -hmm. Uh, but we always uh, talk about 1,400 species and, uh, and so on and so forth. But it's, in, it's uh, important to know that there are very, very different habitats, very, very different growth patterns. For example, in the New World, you, know, you have a lot of, uh, let's say, what they call uh, herbaceous bamboos. Herbaceous bamboos are smaller to larger bamboos. Uh, you have in Africa, you have Olira latifolia, which grows everywhere into the forest. And then you have uh, a few fantastic, uh, fantastically small 
uh, let's say, uh, bamboo is growing in South America, in the New World, in uh, Central America. These are the, the herbaceous bamboos. Mm -hmm. And then you have the woody bamboos who grow into forests too. You have the, the tropical ones, the subtropical ones, and the temperate ones. We all know that. But uh, for example, you also have uh, vining ones. For example, Dinocloa scandens. Uh, can have, uh, let's say, uh, culms growing over vegetation up to 120 meters long. Huh? So oh. there's a, a lot of, like like rattans, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of diversity there. So And what we see in agriculture and, uh, uh, and so on are only yeah, just a small subset of the bamboos that we know in, in botany and taxonomy. Absolutely. So to be clear about that. Again, bamboo moved from a plain as a grass and evolved into the forest, the forest side, and then into the forest. Uh, and that's uh, very important to know because they are species adapted to, let's say, not open plains. I mean, uh, they grow best in, let's say, all the temperate bamboos, like uh, not, not the Philostachys idolis, they grow on mountains, but most of the Fargesia grow uh, under trees. They're understory. So you have a lot of diversity there as well. So just to understand that it's not a one uh, size fits all solution. Yeah. Uh, then of course, when you when you talk about using bamboo as a, a ecological services, uh, what comes to mind is that uh, it's a fantastic plant that grows everywhere. So one of the most uh, the most uh, interesting uses is uh, on degraded lands. For example, lands that have been uh, subject to mining, coal mining or uh, mining of uh, ore, uh, metal ores and so on, which are definitely very bad in every respect. They have been using acid uh, everywhere to, to get uh, the metals out of the ores. So nothing grows there. And there's always a chance that some bamboo will grow there. And that's fantastic because then you start instead of having nothing, you start with the vegetation. And as we all know, once you have a vegetation, you can have, uh, uh, let's say, like a, like a forest grows on degraded land. It can invite clouds and it can uh, maintain its own regulation of water and uh, and uh, and so on and so forth. That's a remarkable, uh, remarkable uh, thing of life. Uh, we know that or that was hypothesized 40 years ago as the Gaia hypothesis. That, uh, uh, But basically, that's how it happens. So, for example, the Amazon where you reside, uh, there's so every all the water flows down to the uh, Atlantic Ocean and there it, evapor uh, there it evaporates, comes back like a stream over the Amazon. And then, uh, yeah, until uh, the end, uh, the Andes Mountains. So there's always an interrelation between greening of the earth and getting more favorable, uh, let's say, uh, conditions, uh, abiotic conditions, mm -hmm. uh, to to have more growth. Huh? Greening yeah. of the earth. So degrading lands. We also have done tests. For example, if you uh, grow bamboo. Onto, onto lands uh, which uh, have been uh, with zinc and cadmium and so on. So the bamboos take up these things as well. Huh? So, and then you can burn the bamboo, you use it as bioenergy, and then you can recollect uh, the materials. Another way is uh, we, we also planted bamboo. Normally, if you have a, a petrol station, huh? what happens is people every drop, every, every day, people uh, just drip a few drips but yep. uh, over the years, it's uh, there's a plume of let's say twenty meters wide or thirty meters wide and five meters deep, for example, mm -hmm. and that's in the soil. So we planted bamboo there, and although bamboo did not uh, uh, root very uh, roots only very shallowly, mm -hmm. so after a year, ten years or so, uh, that that area also was clean. And we don't really know what happened there, but but uh, partly it was taken up by bamboo, this uh, gasoline. This is soil. linked with the microorganism, most likely. Which yes, are yes, most likely, the most likely. Yeah. But we know we know very little about uh, the soil of. Uh, mm -hmm. We have tried to study that, and uh, normally there's a lot of interaction with the uh, bamboo on the roots. On the roots, you have what they call mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza mm -hmm. grow inside the roots or on top of the roots mm -hmm. and they they use uh, sugars from the plants and uh, 
they uh, uh, they they help uh, the plant taking up uh, let's say uh, nutrients from the soil like a, uh, a highway right kind of nutrient highway for the plant there everything yeah yeah but an ecosystem consists of uh, but but even in the plant itself huh, we have uh, uh, there's a lot of microorganisms inside of the plant there's mm -hmm. hundreds of types of organisms mycoplasma microbes uh, let's say uh, viruses and so on, just sitting there doing nothing or uh, just exploding at some point, uh, leading to diseases. Mm -hmm. So uh, every plant is a kind of ecosystem in itself, not only in the soil, also in the leaves. The leaves also have uh, many, many, uh, see, also a leaf is an ecosystem. Uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff growing there as well. Anyway. Uh, so uh, the the soil and uh, now uh, yeah you also met Everest Holmes in uh, in Germany uh, yes. which was a he's uh, doing a lot of stuff uh, there but but it's uh, we we have to be a bit careful because we looked at mycorrhiza in the past mm -hmm. and once uh, if, you, if you have a certain uh, species of mycorrhiza growing uh, Sante <laughs> when there's a at one point when there's a flood or something mm -hmm. then the whole population of mycorrhiza can change overnight so there's yeah. not a one uh, fits all solution and it's not so, so stable so but, it, it really adapts to the environment climate temperature yeah. and everything right but but uh, what i would like to come back to also is of course you have uh, they provide shade uh, the leaves fall down they for, form a horizon uh, which uh, which uh, uh, limits evaporation of the soil of the water, so water going in does not evaporate uh, so easily. So there's a lot of benefits uh, from bamboo, and that's that's also you don't have that in a planar uh, grassland, for example. Just the the the, the when it rains, uh, they take up some some part, and mm -hmm. when it's dry, they they go brown, and all the soil uh, goes through. But in other cases, in, in more forestry conditions, soils tend to get wetter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot, and I must say there's, um, like in most of uh, nature, uh, we hardly started scratching the surface of understanding nature. That's my position as a biologist and a, and a scientist. Huh? So we can speculate a lot, but there's still, in, in 200 years from now, we will be amazed on, on how much we didn't know. Okay, that being said, um, important, yeah. But but uh, I want to also during this podcast, post podcast, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. I uh, this morning I gave a talk because uh, on on carbon. Yes, if carbon sequestration an... yes. with bamboo, carbon. probably. Yeah, because uh, people tend to overestimate like thirty percent more here and there, and that's simply not true. Because bamboo is like uh, like trees, uh, is a C3 plant, and like grasses. Mm -hmm. uh, so corn is a C4 plant, and uh, many uh, many uh, succulents are C4. They can they have another pathway of uh, of transforming sunlight into sugars. But most plants that we know are C3 plants, so they have a very established uh, photosynthetic system, uh, which doesn't change too much between species. Mm -hmm. So what bamboo does, it takes up uh, CO2 from the air, converts it into sugar. Sugar is uh, converted into starch. The starch is spread towards the rest of the plant. And the uh, newly growing shoots, uh, they are from the mobilization of starch. Mm -hmm. The starch uh, breaks down in sugar, gives the energy for growth. Uh, so that's basically the, the process. Now, uh, now comes the catch. So... Um, if you have a stand of bamboo, a mature stand of bamboo, so you would have in Philostachys edelweiss stand, you would have uh, happen to have around 200 tons of carbon sequestered per hectare. Yeah. That means in the soil, that means the roots, that means uh, rhizomes, that means uh, culms and branches and leaves. Do we know but, sorry, what they what we call the stocks? Huh? So the, mm -hmm. the pools. Uh, exactly, yeah. and and do we know how much is in the poles and in the roots? Because the roots. Yes, really, yes, yes. We have, have published around this. We have published a paper with Professor Lisa. Mm -hmm. I can share it. But yeah. but what is important in a, in a mature forest that is unmanaged? Mm -hmm. huh? So you have new combs showing, mm -hmm. uh, growing, mm -hmm. and then the the individual uh, life of a comb is eight to ten years. 
Yeah. yeah. Until so it's... it starts to degrade, mm -hmm. which means that the CO2 that you have taken up to grow that plant mm -hmm. is released back into the uh, into the soil. Natural, so yeah. overall in a mature forest, if, if you started with a new plantation for the first 10 years, uh, let's say for the first six years, you have uh, a net uptake of, of uh, let's say CO2 converted into biomass. But for the rest of the life of an unmanaged plantation or natural forest, the result is almost net zero. Mm -hmm. So because you have respiration from the soil, you have respiration from uh, leaves that are fallen on the ground, mm -hmm. you have respiration from the plant itself, you have uh, respiration from dying combs, or even in monocarpic flowering, the whole forest uh, release these CO2 just back into the... You know? Yeah. So the uh, in a in a mature forest, what you take up as CO two and what you release is almost a balance. So the, the real thing... value is not the carbon per se we're focusing now, but much broader approach of of the ecosystem services. Yes, yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but but I wanted to if you manage a plantation, mm -hmm. uh, if you take out if you harvest a plantation, you take out the material and put it into products, mm -hmm. then you store the carbon. Mm -hmm. But there's a catch here too because you can store it for ten years or fifty years in a building. Mm -hmm. But eventually, if the building is destroyed, it goes back into CO two. Nice. So you delay the, the you delay, and that's mm -hmm. we have to do everything to capture carbon and so on. Uh, all all good, but we have to be realistic. We can't capture carbon uh in a way that uh, the most efficient way of capturing carbon from the soil has been uh uh, uh the oils yeah? petrifying so and, and yeah yeah <laughs> and that's millions anyway, so, of years right time so but uh, in, in that way i would say that uh, if you look at the uh, uh, chinese fir plantation or eucalypt plantations or bamboo mm -hmm. uh, they they capture almost similar uh, amounts of uh, carbon per thing uh, what is also I have also to tell you if you harvest bamboo you harvest the wet biomass mm -hmm. and uh, you have to compute dry biomass to to get to carbon capture uh, the dry biomass so the the moisture content of bamboos mm -hmm. that you harvest depend on the species they depend on the locality they depend on the season could be between 30 or 50 60 percent mm -hmm. so if you want to capture 10 ton of carbon you need 20 ton of dry matter, which means 30 ton of, uh, let's say, harvested wet material, approximately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh? So it's uh, so, so these are rules of thumb, but uh, very important if you want to, to manage that. Now, having said that, uh, uh, people focus on, on carbon because they can get carbon credits. And as I noted in my Dortmund speak uh, talk, we should uh, not consider it as a, uh, yeah, a recurring revenue, but as a kickstart for a bamboo plantation that helps you finance it. Mm -hmm. But in the end, uh, it should come from other services, uh, products, but also eco service. Eco service could be degraded lands, it could be urban greening, because one of the nice uh, things about bamboo is that it's uh, green year round. So Absolutely. they produce, they do photosynthesis year round in the city. Mm -hmm. Whereas deciduous trees have their, uh, they shed their leaves uh, and they go into to a period of dormancy during winter. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not the case with bamboo. They produce, they start doing photosynthesis every year. They take up, the process goes on and on. And, and probably the ecosystem services of bamboo could help regulate slightly those extreme weather conditions we were having, like a lot of rain or no rain, like dry, like uh, Europe, we've had like heavier dry seasons. And yeah, and... well, but, yeah. Or so that's, your... that's something that's something that's uh, for another podcast. But <laughs> one thing I would like, yeah, well, it's a, but yeah. one thing I would like to stress. Huh? Mm -hmm. So when I was a student, which was a long time ago, mm -hmm. uh, the, the people started to do CO2 enrichment in glass houses. Mm -hmm. So if you say you have a grass, glass house, Mm -hmm. uh, the sun comes up, it's closed, and then the tomato plants in the greenhouse start to take up CO2. Mm -hmm. You uh, you deplete the CO2 and uh, photosynthesis stops more or less, uh, or not stops them. But, so people buy containers of CO2 and they release it in the greenhouse. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. What was found, yeah, what was found uh, everywhere was that 
if you go instead of we you know, uh, now we have 410 ppm uh, co2 in the uh, but if you go to 700 800 ppm under controlled conditions mm -hmm. plants grow better yeah. Huh? yeah we have seen we have basically yeah. seen that the the grain the grain bushels per, per hectare uh, grain yield and co2 go uh, hand in hand it's so it's ecosystem, not a system right rule. we don't know huh? sorry it's an ecosystem one needs the other yeah. the plants it's need an ecosystem the CO2. But it's... co2 co2 is really plant nutrition mm -hmm. so the more co2 and there's of course there's a cap huh? mm -hmm. but uh, the more co2 uh, the better plants grow yeah absolutely so it's it's we're currently still in this uh, mindset where uh the, the bad and the good and it's it's absolutely not like yeah, that because in absolutely. nature and the, the 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 myopic focus on co2 is just crazy because it's mm -hmm. uh yeah well there's 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 more than uh co2 problems in this world there's yeah don't get yeah. me started on this on poverty and uh, illiteracy yeah, no 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 but we can but, we can definitely do some some good stuff with bamboo being food being climate regulation water regulation um it's not like you said also miracle plant but it, it can help it's a fantastic us. plant it's a fantastic plant yeah 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 let's keep it out but i want to avoid the point miracle because uh, mm -hmm. yeah so it's, you don't sell it. it's a fantastic plant because for us it was also a multi cash crop because mm -hmm. ideally you could harvest the leaves for high added value products like pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. or tea leaves huh? mm -hmm. uh, additives and then you could sell other parts of the combs. What you don't want to do is charcoal and burning the thing because that's 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 a low low. Uh, let's say that's yeah. uh, you want to have you want to the multi cash is try to sell it to the highest possible added value. The best value, yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. that's the classic approach, right? Like most people are really focusing on bamboo on how can I transform that bamboo, which per pole has very low value, economic value, yeah. into, a, let's say, I don't know, a smartphone case, which costs $10, and I just need like a tiny yeah. bit of bamboo, right? Or, or, or veneer or yeah. whatever. But, but, um, but focusing, focusing on, uh, yeah, well, we're focusing on eco services, but just going back to just the last uh, statement on this, yeah. we should also try to find uh, most most things are substitutes mm -hmm. substitutes for timber mm -hmm. substitutes for plastic mm -hmm. try to we should try to find original uses of bamboo as well better mm -hmm. much better than just replacing like also replacing an old mindset and comparing bamboo to steel or, or to wood instead of thinking how can we use bamboo straight like from from scratch without having to compare it to something different yeah. because it's it's different it's the giant grass <laughs> And 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 you in the beginning of this week you published this article about this uh, very old origins, yeah. but I was just writing an article uh, in the 1930s. Uh, there was a, there were a lot of uh, Western scientists visiting China and studying bamboo, and there was one who talked about the bamboo age. And what did he mean by the bamboo age? He said, well, in the West we have uh, the Stone Age and uh, the uh, Bronze Age and Iron Age. Yeah. But in all these things where all the civilizations where bamboo grows, they have been the bamboo age has been there from the very beginning, yeah. from the very start that bamboo and people came into contact, they have been using it. They have found it as a useful plant for various ways. Just that it has uh, been lost. Bamboo because of age course. around the world has been existing since since the dawn of humanity. Yeah. And I like that that phrase bamboo age, and that's yeah. basically what uh, things also said anyway i would like to come back to the ecosystem services mm -hmm. because uh, we have the six minutes year. left <laughs> sorry we have six minutes left that's <laughs> going to be perfect that's going to be perfect <laughs> okay. so uh, so i also spoke uh, in the dortmund conference about water use efficiency mm -hmm. exactly one of the partners in the bamboo for europe project uh, what did they do they have a greenhouse they have plants in a pot and they have controlled addition of water. Right? Mm -hmm. And so after, after say so they give enough water, they can give water in wet conditions, medium conditions and dry conditions. They call this the water potential of the soil. Mm -hmm. They can control that. Mm -hmm. And under these conditions, they tested Philostachys and they tested bamboos and so on. They didn't grow very 
high because it's a greenhouse. But what they found was that uh, they measure afterwards, they measure the, the biomass. Mm -hmm. And then the biomass uh, is built using water. Huh? Mm -hmm. And they, they can estimate because it's very controlled. They can estimate or they can uh, uh, know quantitatively how much water goes into one kilogram of biomass of bamboo. Mm -hmm. Now, they found that it was around 300 liters per kilogram of dry ba bamboo mass. Now, you wow. might say that's a lot. That's a lot. But it was consistent over all tropical and uh, temperate bamboos. But what was striking was that if they compared it to uh, beets and uh, 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 let's say uh, classical crops and mm -hmm. uh, agriculture, huh? not corn that that's a C3, uh, C4 plant that's special, uh, but grains and uh, beets and uh, all these things, they use six to seven hundred liters per square, uh, per kg. Mm -hmm. So the water footprint so of bamboo is much, much more efficient. Yes. In conclusion, so that's that's according to me for the next uh, century, the biggest added value of bamboo, which means it uses water very efficiently. So if there is a bit of water in the growing season, it's happy. The bamboo is happy. They'll send up new shoots, and uh, that's it. And then when the dry season comes, they they close down their uh, their stomata, their uh, uh, let's say uh, they don't uh, lose moisture mm -hmm. and that's it so because of all these uh, climate change uh, things i don't believe the carbon capture of bamboo will make any difference but you can build forests yeah. and you can uh, the the water uh, the water consumption is let's say uh, so much lower uh, so much more efficient mm -hmm. uh, that this might be in my, in my humble opinion as a scientist with you know, 30 years or so uh, uh, or 35 years of experience in bamboo might be the best uh, best thing that uh, bamboo can bring to humanity because water scarcity and so on is uh, going to be one of the big the big issues. Yeah. So so one of the things what are one of the things in climate change climate change is all the time but one of the things is that local local uh, local ecosystems can break down. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, the Sahara Desert was a very uh, yeah, healthy ecosystem. You know that. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Five thousand yeah. years ago, it was forests and all that. And now it's uh, very it can different. Go, it can go quickly. So locally, mm -hmm. uh, things will change very rapidly. So planting bamboo there and the water use efficiency taking into account is mm -hmm. they they build it like a kind of forest uh, ecosystem, mm -hmm. but using water scarcely. Which and this means is interesting because. Sorry, this is also like one of the points was misunderstood by most of the public, which is like, oh, bamboo uses a lot of water. It will dry everything. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's it, actually, it's the other way around. Bamboo will help uh, you with the water. Facts, facts, not fiction. Exactly. But uh, anyway, so, but uh, we, we need to do that. That came out as a, as a good experiment, but we need to repeat that. Huh? Mm -hmm. But uh, Jano Prince uh, also has uh, bamboos in uh, South Africa. He told me uh, about bamboos of Balcoa standing next to eucalypts. When it's so dry in summer that eucalypts shed their leaves, mm -hmm. bamboo is just standing there. It sheds leaves, but not too many. And when the, when the spring comes and the water flows, bamboo grows happily. Hmm? And it, it can manage very little water, or it can manage also lots of water, depending on the bamboo type. Some bamboo yes, yes. are six months below, like two meters in water, and they survive also. So this yes, is yes. interesting. And, yeah. And in the in the west of uh, India, for example, you have Dendrocolum structus, which grows in not in a desert, but in very dry conditions. So, uh, mm. yeah. So you have, uh, let's say, you have, uh, let's say, yeah, many many b bamboos like river cane in the U.S. grow near rivers. Huh? Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, in Japan too, for example, the sasas and the Indo. Huh? They, they need grow... additional humidity, and 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 the yeah. bamboos astrictus he can really manage like just the yeah. probably yeah, in Philostachys. Be... Yeah. In Philostachys, you have some species that have uh, air canals in their rhizomes. Mm -hmm. So if they're submerged, they're mm -hmm. flooded. They have. They can transport the roots. Or they can transport the air through their uh, rhizome air canals. Wow, that's beautiful. So there's a, there's a lot of. 
there's a lot of uh, variation in the bamboos that uh, people just don't know about mm -hmm. or just don't understand right and so on. So there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of education. I call that bamboo literacy, yeah. uh, which means uh, learning more about bamboo, knowing more about bamboo. So uh, yeah, so I, I would like people to to know more about bamboo, learn more about bamboo, and not focusing on single issues and things like that, or simple, uh, just repeating what others say. And uh, also, what is very important that people get better insight into the numbers. And I also have to say that we don't have the numbers yet. We have to measure the numbers over the next decades. So, uh, because uh, introducing a new crop into an agricultural system or a forestry system is not easy. It took the Chinese 30 years to build their supply chain to, to have the uh, mozo forests uh, harvesting uh, under control. Uh, then, uh, yeah. Wow. 30 years. Yeah, that's... Making material, 30 years. Uh, they started wow. in the 80s with wow. flooring for containers. Mm -hmm. And now they ship uh, around the world. It's a billion dollar business. Um, so uh, that's, that's something that does not grow overnight. No? Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. So. But from, from what do you think? What's the most uh, probable way where we're going to get the numbers? Um, probably people really within the bamboo, because uh, I mean, it's, it's going to get take time and we need like real, real numbers. Like you said, not yeah. like, fantastic uh, uh yeah. so, so you numbers. need to you need to get universities doing and measuring and students measuring mm -hmm. so there's no other way to do that huh? so uh, increasingly we have uh, we have let's say in agriculture we have access to drones for example mm -hmm. which, which can access uh so the even even uh, if you have a plantation it can assess the let's say the via let's say the uh, how how healthy a plantation is, for example, because of because of the the status of the leaves. Huh? Mm -hmm. We we see the leaves as green, but they reflect other uh, frequencies as well, which can be measured by a spectrophotometer, for example, in drones. Huh? So there's there's more and more uh, ways to do that. There's more and more, let's say, interest in uh, the geometrical way of uh, doing things. So if you measure a leaf. Uh, the length and the width and you know which size and then you have more and better insights in uh, quantitative numbers mm -hmm. uh, the, mostly in bamboo diameter at breast height is a very common uh, measure because a bamboo is cylindrical but it's also tapering so uh, most of the measurements are done at you know, 150 meters 1.50 meters that's at, important uh, breast height. <laughs> so it's not at the bottom or not like going up but really no, no. it makes sense yeah but uh, you have to think yeah. about it so it's <laughs> it's a general way of uh, let's say some somewhere here huh? mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, it's somewhere between large and small uh, small and uh, tall people but uh, that's how they measure it mm. uh, so and then you you get a kind of if your diameter at breast height gives you uh, if you harvest uh, a number of cows for example mm -hmm. and you measure this diameter at breast height Mm -hmm. and then you measure the biomass then there turns out to be a nice mathematical correlation between these things so that in the future you can just measure diameter uh, breast uh, height mm -hmm. and then uh, it deduce from that the amount of biomass mm. okay fantastic so um well i think we we got to the end of our podcast for today to keep it yeah. short is there uh, anything um, you would like to share for now, or should we just like add the, some of the papers you published within the blog article so people can? Yeah, well, so in the, in the blog article, the, it was a presentation that I shared, the paper mm -hmm. of ours with Professor Lisa, and then I also shared an IMBAR uh, publication. Mm -hmm. I will share another one, an IMBAR application. Fast... One is how do you assess carbon sequestration? It's not an easy task, yeah? not oh. easy at all. No. Uh, and the second one is uh, how does bamboo com uh, compare to uh, Chinese fur and so on. Mm -hmm. And the general conclusion is they are more or less the same. But as I said, in uh, managed versus unmanaged uh, uh, forests, that's a big difference. No? Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah, yeah. Because one is total natural and the other one is like really managed. 
<laughs> well, no, Not totally, that. totally natural means that the columns after ten years they decay and mm -hmm. put the CO two back in the air. Yeah, it's the cycle. But, but they decay <laughs> and they decay, but they also recycle into nutrients. You see, of course, yeah, yeah, and the soil gets better and all that, but. The carbon, just looking at the carbon, it's not uh, what they currently are looking for, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. I mean, when you turn science into politics, you get a... Uh, funny, uh, funny results. So, 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 <laughs> uh, looking as a, as a scientist uh, to the world and what's happening is, uh, well... Sad. But one last, one last question from my side, maybe three numbers you can share regarding bamboo which where you say look i really those three numbers are numbers we know already are numbers we can build up are there any numbers regarding water regarding um carbon regarding any numbers you really you say look jj those numbers you can you can build on those numbers well yeah carbon as i said it's uh you calculate the dry mass and half of it is carbon stored Okay, half of it. So if you if you have a plantation and you get ten tons uh, dry biomass out of it, about five percent, five five and half of it, five tons will be carbon. Okay, and regarding water, you said three hundred. Water liters. that was just a, a, a original experiment, but this, the guys who did that had long term experience with uh, grains and uh, beets and so on. Mm -hmm. And so now they did it for bamboo and they concluded that it only uses half the water. So I would definitely, if I make might make a choice in the research, I would go for that one. Mm -hmm. And then you, you have different genotypes. As I said, the dendro, dendrocalama strictus in, uh, in Gandhinagar and so on in uh, East India, dry plains, uh, they grow there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third number is, uh, let's say, if I always say, well, if we grow, I'm talking about Western Europe, mm -hmm. uh, we can achieve somewhere between, depending on the on the species, we can get on an annual recurring basis, we can get, uh, let's say, between six and ton, 10 tons of dry matter per year. Huh? Per hectare. Uh, per hectare. And this is not bad. This is not bad. So. Uh, but what I would I would like as a long as the last message. Uh, so bamboo for Europe was designed uh, to adapt bamboo to Europe, and not Europe to bamboo, and that's very important because uh, every continent, every country has its own uh, way of doing things. Uh, farmers have been uh, uh, doing corn or grains for years, and now they have to switch. Uh, it's not going to. So we we have to remove every uncertainty. Uh, and and we, we have to build on facts to convince farmers to plant bamboo. Mm -hmm. And show them and then, what... And then not, only, not only farmers to plant bamboo, but uh, in the supply chain and uh, going to uh, big companies for MDF and uh, wood panels and, and things like that, uh, they want to have a secure supply of bamboo. Huh? Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe you have in one year, you have six tons, but the next year you might have four and then eight or so. So these are all uncertainty factors that need to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. But definitely one of the most hot topics for right now and the future where we are. So we're in the right space, Johan. Uh, thank yeah. you. I'll... Yes. Yeah, I would like to thank you, JJ, for all the efforts and uh, this uh, wonderful podcast and uh, reaching out to people and getting the message out. Uh, Thank you for sharing your knowledge. It's highly appreciated. I'm sure a lot of people will uh, learn a lot of things with this uh, short podcast right now. And don't forget, if you want to keep in the loop, subscribe to YouTube or whatever the channel and uh, stay in the loop and uh, plant bamboo, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Have a great but day. Choose the right species and uh, have realistic expectations and all that. So <laughs> Exactly. Do some reading before planting, but plant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah Thank absolutely. you. Thank you, Johan. Bye, JJ. Bye-bye.